Hello. It's quite high. Okay. So, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to announce our colloquium of mathematics of this semester at the Institute. The speaker is Martin Golubitsky, distinguished professor of natural and mathematical sciences at the Ohio State University. He got his PhD in maths at MIT in 1970 and has been professor of mathematics at Arizona State University, cool and distinguished professor of mathematics at the University of Houston and director of the Mathematical Biosciences Institute at Ohio. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Mathematical Society, and the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics, SIAM. He has also received many prizes throughout the years. He has been elected to the councils of SIAM, AAAS, and AMS. He was the founding, founding editor-in-chief of the SIAM Journal of Applied Dynamical Systems and has also been president of uh, SIAM. Uh, he has published many books including undergraduate, graduate, and non-technical books, and over 100 papers. Marty uh, Golubitsky has been given very important contributions in the field of singularity theory, nonlinear dynamics, and bifurcation theory, studying the role of symmetries in the formation of patterns in physical systems and the role of network architecture in the dynamics of coupled systems. More recently, he has been involved with mathematical aspects of biological applications. This is the last part, uh, I believe, that what we are hearing today. So it's an honor to have you here at the Institute, Marty. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, thank you, Miriam, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I was reminded of how long ago it was since I've been here, and I don't think I want to think about that. It's uh, nice to be back. Uh, today, I wanted to talk about uh, coupled systems of differential equations. And for the most part, it's a talk about differential equations, but there won't be any differential equations. Uh, what I really want to do is emphasize the kind of uh, information, predictions, if you will, that you can get by just understanding the properties of the differential equations and properties of their solutions without actually having to solve them uh, directly. Uh, so for coupled systems of differential equations, uh, I'll be talking about patterns of phase shift synchrony uh, for periodic solutions to such equations, uh, relate symmetries to network architecture. So what's a coupled system? It's going to be uh, sort of defined by a graph, as, as you'll see shortly. And uh, uh, the kinds of solutions that we can find will have to do with Hopf bifurcation from a maximally symmetric state, and I won't assume that you remember what Hopf bifurcation is uh, as we go along. Uh, this, a lot of this work started um, uh, circa uh, 2000, uh, 2000, 1999 for me. And uh, I'm doing the best I can to um, demonstrate uh, what's going on. When you walk, uh, if you swap your legs, a little hard to do, you are where you will be in half a period later. So animal gates uh, walk, uh, or with four-legged animals, more exotic things, are really defined by space-time symmetries. And we got interested in these spatiotemporal symmetries of periodic solutions in part because of the animal gates. So it's, it's an old uh, application, but it's fun. Uh, to look at. And then I will end with a discussion of binocular rivalry. And I'm guessing that most of you don't know what binocular rivalry is, but you know what visual illusions are. Uh, and uh, I'll be able to explain what this is in terms of uh, uh, 
the, now the, the point that I'd like to make is that you can make predictions even without writing down models, model equations. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Okay, so the simplest coupled system is two identical systems of differential equations. So x1 dot is f of x1, the internal state variable of node 1. x2 is the coupling variable to node 1, and that's over there. That the fact that they're identical means that x2 dot has the same f, but the internal state variable is now x2, and the coupling variable is x1. Uh, such as uh, such a set of equations has symmetry. So what do I mean by symmetry in this context? It's a linear map that takes solutions to solutions. So if x1 of t, x2 of t is a solution, then so is x2 of t, x1 of t. That is, I can swap and get a solution. Now, there are two special kinds of periodic solutions that occur in this system. Uh, one is where uh, well, the one that's the second one, a half period out of phase oscillation. So this walking is swap half a period phase shift. Uh, there's another periodic solution is swap, you get the same thing. That is, x1 of t equals x2 of t. They're synchronous. And as I like to say, uh, th there should be time for a quiz. Uh, what is the uh, standard biped gate uh, which satisfies this first symmetry? I'm not going to demonstrate it, uh, but a, a hop. You move both legs together, and that's uh, what's going on. Okay, so I want to point out why symmetry uh, sort of picks out these two special kinds of solutions. If I have a symmetry of a differential equation, uh, gamma, um, and remember, that means gamma takes solutions to solutions, the trajectory x of t can be picked up and put down on itself without it being pointwise put down on itself. That is, I just take the trajectory, pick it up, and stick it down on itself by the symmetry. If that happens, then gamma x of 0 must be somewhere on the trajectory, so it's x of theta t. I mean, this is a capital T periodic solution. Theta is between 0 and 1. Uh, I have two solutions, gamma x of t, because gamma is a symmetry, x of t is a solution, this must be a solution. x of t plus theta t must be a solution, and they have the same initial conditions. So they're equal for all time. Now, suppose that uh, gamma, uh, gamma is an order two symmetry, a transposition, as in this case up here, where we just swap the uh, two nodes. Uh, if I apply gamma twice. Gamma squared x of t must be x of t, because gamma squared is the identity. It's going to be x, apply gamma once, x of t plus theta t. Apply gamma twice, x of t plus 2 theta t. So 2 theta must be congruent to uh, one mo, uh, 0 mod 1. So either theta is 0 or theta is a half. If theta is 0, I have the synchronous solution. If it's a half, I have this half period out of phase solutions. So symmetry picks out the solution types as being natural in a network. And I don't need to know what the differential equation, what f is, uh, to understand that this is, go this is the case. Uh, now, how do you find solutions? Everyone knows uh, pretty much that uh, if you can find a closed form formula for a periodic solution to some differential equation, you're doing a homework exercise. Uh, it's very rare in, uh, in applications to actually be able to write down a closed form solution. Uh, and the way that we find closed form solutions in uh, systems of differential equations is through Hoff bifurcation. That's uh, one of the standard methods. And Hoff bifurcation can be understood through this uh, simple equation which I've written up here. That is, I have a linear part and a cubic nonlinear part. The linear part, when lambda is um, negative, this is a spiral sink. And when lambda is positive, I have a spiral source. So uh, the uh, uh, 
there's a difference when lambda crosses zero, but the nonlinear part is always pointing in towards the origin. So when lambda is negative, both the linear part and the nonlinear part are pointing in towards the origin, and it's not surprising that solutions just come into the origin. On the other hand, when uh, lambda is positive, linearly, so near the origin, you're spiraling out. Nonlinearly, you're coming in. It's balanced off by a periodic solution, and that's the uh, genesis of uh, one way to get periodic solutions. Now, notice that I could write this equation in polar coordinates, and if I do so, uh, then r dot will be lambda minus r squared r. So when lambda is positive, r equal root lambda is, a, is going to be a zero of the radial equation, so the solution will just go around on a circle uh, given by root lambda. So I know a little bit more that the solution grows with uh, 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 ampli the amplitude growth is root lambda. Okay, uh, the Hopf theorem is much more general than that given example. Uh, in its simplest form, I have a system of differential equations with x in, let's say, a large number of variables, uh, Rn, and I have an equilibrium. Take a look at the Jacobian, and I sort of mentioned back here, the Jacobian is just, uh, for the origin, is just this matrix, and when lambda is zero, there are purely imaginary eigenvalues. That is, the eigenvalues of the whole system are lambda plus or minus i. And in general, let's assume that the, at this equilibrium, the Jacobian has a non-zero pair of purely imaginary eigenvalues, uh, simple purely imaginary eigenvalues, and all of the other eigenvalues are off the imaginary axis. Then generically, there is a unique branch of small amplitude periodic trajectories emanating from the origin. So all I have to do is understand the linear structure of the Jacobian in order to find these kinds of solutions. So let's go back to the two-node example. Uh, let's assume that, well, let's see. When x1 equals x2, these equations are the same. So this is going to be a flow invariant subspace. That is, if I start with an uh, initial condition where x1 is equal to x2, then it will stay equal for all time. And uh, suppose I have an equilibrium in that space. Uh, Let's look at the Jacobian. Uh, I can assume it's at the origin. The Jacobian is going to be two, given by two k by k matrices, alpha, which is the linearized internal dynamics, and beta, which is the linearized coupling. J is just alpha, beta, beta, alpha. You can just read that off from the equations. And this matrix has two invariant subspaces, xx and x minus x. Uh, if you compute j of xx, you'll just get alpha plus beta times x in both coordinates. So uh, uh, the restriction of j to this invariant subspace is alpha plus beta. j of x minus x is just alpha minus beta x and minus alpha minus beta x. So this is an invariant subspace. Now, uh, that never happens for a by accident. Uh, you have two, uh, the group of symmetries of these equations is Z2, which is the flip, and these are uh, just the irreducible representations of Z2. There are two of them, trivial and non-trivial, trivial and non-trivial. Uh, but when, if the eigenvalues are critical for alpha plus beta, that is, there's a purely imaginary pair of eigenvalues in alpha plus beta, then you will get the synchronous solutions if alpha minus beta are the critical eigenvalues, you'll get these half-period out-of-phase solutions. So uh, we sort of understand uh, how you can find solutions with different spatiotemporal symmetries. Okay, so I promised you quadrupeds, four-legged animals. And uh, this is supposed to be preparation for you going to the zoo. Uh, the... Uh, uh, this slow walk of, uh, the this, this slow gait of a four-legged animal is usually a walk, and it is left rear, left front, right rear, right front, left rear, left front, right rear, right front. 
And it's a slow gait, so you can actually watch an animal in the zoo or your dog, it's take your choice. Uh, you will get this zero quarter period phase shift, half period, three quarters of a period as these things go. A pace, both left legs, both right legs, both left legs, both right legs. A trot, that's a little harder to demonstrate. Left rear, right front, move synchronously. Left front, right rear, move synchronously. And then they're a half a period out of phase. Uh, bounds, uh, this is what you'll find if, you go, if, if there are squirrels or something outside. Uh, the bounds is uh, the front legs and rear legs move synchronously, but it's a half period phase shift. So front, back, front, back, front, back, front, back. And uh, pronk, uh, which I'm sure you've all heard of, uh, is a, a gate where all four legs move together. And you say, what? Um, Little deer will do this, and it's really quite uh, amusing to watch them uh, go like that. So the, the, these are five standard gates of quadrupeds. And are you assuming that uh, no matter the animal we deal with, the way of walking or trotting is the same? Yes. Uh, 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 let me give you the short answer now and a slightly longer answer later. Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, okay. And uh, I'll try to explain why. Uh, uh. Uh, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, many different animals. Uh, so, uh, I, l well, let me give a little longer a uh, answer. Uh, with pace and trot, uh, some animals prefer to pace and some prefer to trot. And typically a... Uh, short-legged animal, dogs and uh, um, rats. Uh, I, I'm running out of animals at the moment. Hmm? Alligators. Uh, uh, they, t uh, they tend to trot. So if, if you look at your dog, it'll tend to trot uh, the, the diagonal legs. Long-legged animals like camels and giraffes tend to pace. And horses, which are kind of in the middle uh, do either, and there are trotters and pacers because some horses like to trot and some like to pace. Could you really not ask that question <laughs> just at the moment? Uh, I'll, I'll try to explain uh, where it comes from, but uh, I, I want to. Be, uh, I have to get a little further to uh, to do that. Uh, okay, so uh, the w what I'd like to say is that um, uh, all of these gates that I've shown you can be described by spatiotemporal symmetries. In the case of a trot, think of swapping left and right. You're swapping the diagonal, so you're a half a period out of phase. Uh, if you swap front back, you're swapping the diagonals, you're a half period out of phase. So these uh, kinds of symmetries have special phase relations. With the pace, if you swap left and right, again, you're a half a period out of phase. But if you swap front and back, you're in phase because both left legs, both right legs moving together. So zero phase shift. The walk, this left rear, left front, right rear, right front, has a quarter period phase shift in the, um, uh, built into the definition of the gate. And you say, are they exact? Or at least I'll ask a question that is often asked. Are these exact? Well, in the platonic ideal of the definition of the gate, it is. And most animals who do these things uh, come pretty close to being exact. Um, now, biologists believe that there is something called a central pattern gener generator, locomotor central pattern generator, uh, that produces the gait rhythms somewhere in the nervous system. Uh, does such a thing exist? It's known for uh, small uh, for primitive animals like uh, lamprey eel. Uh, the neuroscientists can go in and find the exact, uh, they know the neuron that is bursting in, um, cadence, in the same cadence of the gate, in this case a swimming gate. Uh, with mammals it's harder, but there's a lot of indirect evidence, and I gather some direct evidence that uh, loco uh, locomotor central pattern generators exist. Uh, now, 
Hodgkin Huxley got a Nobel Prize for writing down, as it were, the equation of a neuron. And it's a, uh, a, a fourth order system uh, of equations, very complicated. Uh, so I'd like to think of uh, that, that Hodgkin and Huxley got their Nobel Prize for uh, uh, showing that a neuron is a system of differential equations. Now, that's perhaps not the, the same way the biologists would view it, but it, it's a start. But it gives you a way of saying that if in the nervous system there's a network of neurons that is controlling these gates, and the neurons individually are systems of differential equations, then this whole coupled nor a network of neurons is a coupled system of differential equations. So a reasonable mathematical question is what is the, small, uh, what is the uh, smallest network that will have rhythms that are the same as spatiotemporal symmetries for periodic solutions that are the same as walk, trot, and pace. And, uh, a lot of theory of the type that I was talking about just for the two-node network is needed to say that there are um, eight nodes. Uh, you need eight nodes. So you might think four nodes would suffice. One node is sending its output to each leg. Doesn't work. And uh, that's a kind of interesting fact. Uh, if you go to this eight-node system, which has symmetries Z4 cross Z2, that is, I have bilateral symmetry, the kappa swaps uh, 1, 3, 5, 7 with 2, 4, 6, 8, and uh, the Z4 symmetry is just uh, the um, product of two permutations, 1, 3, 5, 7, and 2, 4, 6, 8, two cyclic permutations. So in this uh, fact, which I'm asking you to accept, I want to ask, well, what, what are the periodic solutions that I can get by Hopf bifurcation from a trivial solution, from what I'd call the stand? What are the possibilities? And it turns out there are six possibilities. So pace, trot, and walk are not surprising because the whole system was constructed to have these kinds of symmetries. Pronk and bound is a little bit it's a prediction, but not a surprising one, because uh, we know animals do that. But what came up was a gate, which uh, we called the jump. Let me see if I can describe this. Front legs down at time zero, rear legs down a quarter of a period later, and three quarters of a period later, front legs down. So, OK? Now, Miriam mentioned that I was in the um, uh, I was at the University of Houston for ma uh, many years, and one of the really interesting uh, things you can do in Houston is to go to the Houston Livestock and Rodeo Show. Okay, so uh, now the horse is going front, back, front, back. Uh, let's watch this in slow motion. Uh, the uh, gate is front legs down. Now it's in the gate front. Rear, wait a while, front, rear, wait a while, front, rear. Now, if this, were, if this horse is doing our jump, then it should take three times as long to go from back to front as from front to back. Well, Ian Stewart and I had been working on this, and it, you know, every once in a while something happens in life which is really neat. And uh, afternoon, we're working on this eight-node uh, model, and notice that you have um, this jump. That evening, we go to the rodeo. And uh, so there we are sitting trying to count, but realize that um, uh, the rodeo had this instant replay. And after a few months of uh, negotiations, they were willing to give us the movie. And once you have the movie, you can ask, at what frame does, do the uh, front legs come down? 62. At what frame do the rear legs come down? 75. Front legs at 109, and so forth. 
And then you can uh, do something slightly scientific, average the length of the blue regions and the red regions. These are the frame lengths. Divide, and this should be three for the jump, and if it were a bound, one. Uh, now, for those of you who know anything about biology, this is incredibly close, and this wasn't a very well-controlled experiment, uh, but we took it as uh, evidence. So, uh, so what was going on here? Uh, we made a prediction of a gate from the structure of the proposed differential equations, but I've never said what those differential equations are. They could, if, they, if the nodes were single neurons, you might say it's one Hodgkin-Huxley equation for each node. That's four dimensions. So altogether, that's a 32-dimensional system of differential equations with a number of constants uh, floating around in it. Uh, impossible to analyze. So we throw away the differential equation and say, from the structure, what kind of predictions can we make? And this is one uh, which we feel did pan out. Okay, so uh, I promised you uh, that we would talk a little bit about um, rivalry before, uh, about illusions before getting to rivalry. Uh, oh, I, I was going to answer your question. Uh, so let me, about the gallops. Uh, the, the kinds of spatiotemporal symmetries that we were talking about were um, ones that we get directly from, by Hopf bifurcation from an equilibrium, a symmetric equilibrium. There can be secondary states that you get by further bifurcations, further losses of stability, and the gallops are those. We call them secondary uh, gates. So, and there are two kinds of gallop. I don't know whether you're aware of this. Uh, so, a gallop, what is a gallop? Um, uh, the um, front legs hit left, right. The rear legs hit maybe left, right. So, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. That's called a transverse gallop because the order in which the, uh, the legs hit the ground crosses the body. Then there's a rotary gallop, left, right, right, left, left, right, right, left. And both of those are secondary gates. Uh, animals that tend to pace tend to do a rotary gallop. Uh, and this is really neat. Uh, you go watch a giraffe in a zoo, as I said. Uh, this is uh, kind of fun. And uh, those that are short-legged tend to do a transverse gallop. But uh, that's where the gallop comes. Uh, the, what is called a gallop applies to many species. So not all species would necessarily have to do a gallop. Uh, uh, but uh, it, there is one type of gait which we can define by the spatiotemporal symmetries, and many different animals, I mean, different kinds of animals do these, uh, these gaits. Okay, so I hope you've been staring at this. Uh, because what I'd like you to answer is, where is the yellow face? Is it on top or behind? <laughs> that's really, uh, no, no, that's really weird. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> okay, uh, what you will say, what most people see is alternation between those two configurations. It's not periodic, but it is the case that uh, you, will go, uh, you cannot keep, uh, most people cannot focus on one and say, this is what I see. I always see the yellow face on top. Because if you think that, your brain will say, uh-uh, it's behind. So you say, okay, it's behind. Uh-uh, it's in front. You can have a real conversation with your brain. It's not a good one. Uh, so, uh, and th so these are these visual illusions that are going on. Uh, this, I, I like to think that visual illusions come from insufficient information. That is, we are used to uh, having a three-dimensional, uh, inferring a three-dimensional shape from a planar figure. And there are two different three-dimensional shapes that will give you the same projection under the plane. If, apparently, if you try to play this on someone 
uh, a game on someone who has never seen these three-dimensional reconstructions. Uh, and uh, there exist people, for the reason that's true. They look at this and they say, this is very nice. It has 12 lines and, uh, or, and eight dots, and that's a nice figure. And there's nothing, uh, you know, nothing else going on. So you have to know some information uh, in order to see this illusion, but the illusion comes from insufficient information. Now, binocular rivalry is a different game. A subject is shown one image to his or her left eye, and the other is an image to his or her right eye. And it's done, uh, set up, it's hard, it's a really hard experiment to do uh, without uh, being set up on a computer unless you happen to be cross-eyed, uh, as I am. And uh, the, uh, uh, for years, I used to see this thing happen, where I, uh, the kind of, let me describe it in terms of going to the symphony, watching the conductor, and all, all of a sudden, the conductor turned into the trombonist. And uh, it would go back and forth. And what you see in binocular rivalry is that first you see one image, then the other, then the first, then the other. This alternation, just like we saw in the Necker cube. Uh, okay, so uh, the, in this case, the question is how does the brain deal with contradictory information? Now, most, uh, there are two ways in which people model binocular rivalry. One is uh, stochastic because they're trying to get at how frequently do you get this alternation? What's the distribution of alternation times? And the second is that you look at differential equations and try to get um, uh, uh, periodic motions which go back and forth between the left and right images. I'm going to take the second point of view. And then uh, this rivalry experiment is often modeled by a two-node example, just like the one that I started the talk with. And in this case, I'll write down model equations that people uh, like to use. These are so-called rate equations from neuroscience. And uh, the, uh, each node has two variables, an activity variable, the E variable, and a fatigue variable, the H variable variable. They work on different time scales, that's the epsilon, and uh, they're coupled together by a gain function. Well, you know, there's a lot of parameters, there's a lot of possibilities, and uh, I actually don't care about all of that. What I do care about is that in the model, uh, it's, uh, the idea is that if, a, if the activity variable in the A percept is bigger than the one in the B percept, you're perceiving the A percept. If B is bigger than A, the E variables, then you're perceiving the B percept. And if you have a periodic solution of the type uh, that we were talking about, the half period out of phase solutions, then the red percept will be dominant. So you'll see red, then you'll see blue, well, what corresponds to a, B, A, B, and you'll get this alternation. Such a solution can be gotten, as we discussed before, by Hoff bifurcation from an equilibrium where the two left and right are equal. Think about it. If left and right were not equal, let's say in this case the blue uh, activity variable is bigger than the red, then if I get a periodic solution from this state, it'll oscillate, but blue will still always be bigger than red, and you won't, uh, you won't see any alternation. So this kind of state is called a, um, equ well, the equilibrium with different activity levels, a winner-take-all state. Uh, you, you, that is, there's just one image that you see. Uh, and uh, the state where left, uh, the left and right are identically equal the model makes no prediction about what you're going to see. They're called fusion states. So half bifurcation from a fusion state can lead to alternation. And it's just because we're looking at this two-node example that we started with. 
So now I'd like to describe an experiment which proves, so it's interesting use of words in my mind, proves that the two-node model cannot be the correct model or, or is not sufficiently uh, correct to, um, uh, to explain binocular rivalry. So these two pictures, on the uh, left is a monkey, on the right is actually a jungle scene, and uh, it has some writing on it, so I like to call it text. And these experiments were done 20 years ago. Uh, if the, uh, the subjects were shown monkey left eye, text right eye, they saw the alternation between monkey and text, monkey and text, just as uh, predicted, expected. Then the experimentalists did something really novel. They took the pictures and cut them by three lines into six parts. On, they scrambled the images so that on the left you have text, monkey, text, monkey, text, monkey. On the right, monkey, text, monkey, text, monkey, text. And now showed these images to the um, subjects. And what they saw, what they perceived, was that for half of the time, they, start, they saw alternation between these two scrambled images. And for the other half of the time, uh, they saw alternation between the uh, monkey and text. So they had four percepts with the two pictures. The two percept model could not possibly explain what's going on here. Now, let me show you another experiment to show you that it's a little bit more complicated even then. Uh, these are two 24-dot pictures. Each picture has 12 red and 12 green dots. The left picture, where there is a green dot in the left, there is a red dot in the right. Red dot in the left, there is a green dot in the right. So they're sort of complementary. Uh, same set of experimentalists, so same paper, they did this experiment as well. Uh, what did people see? For half of the time, they saw alternation between these scrambled images. And for the other half of the time, you're not surprised now from the monkey text experiment, they saw alternation, or they perceived alternation between uh, the full, uh, pure color uh, uh, pictures. But now, the experimentalists also showed uh, different uh, subjects, left eye all red, right eye all green dots. And what did they see? Well, clearly they saw alternation between all red and all green. Not so clearly as they saw alternation between mixed dots, mixed colored dots. Now, I don't know, and I don't think the experimentalists know, and I don't think the subjects knew, exactly what the distribution of red and green dots were, but they, they definitely perceived these uh, scrambled images as well. And that's, not like, uh, that's different from uh, the monkey text example. OK, so a few years ago, Hugh Wilson, uh, who uh, is quite famous in neuroscience for being one, of the, uh, one half of the Wilson-Cowan equations, uh, is also a vision scientist, and he gave this talk about generalized rivalry. So his idea was that rivalry in the brain, well, you say, well, what, what's rivalry? Okay, you go to a restaurant, and the restaurant has um, uh, three different uh, things, chicken, beef, and pork. And you can't decide, you know, you're really trying to figure out, to decide w which one of these you want. Uh, every once in a while, you know, you say, well, I want chicken. No, I want beef. Uh, no, maybe chicken, maybe yeah, so on. What do you order? Well, you tend to order whatever you were thinking you wanted when the uh, waitress actually shows up. Uh, it's, uh, but there's this rivalry, this the kind of alternation between states. And so what uh, Hugh was trying to get at was how does the brain deal with this kind of rivalry? And uh, what he suggested is that rivalry in the brain is between patterns. And patterns are stored 
in the following way. There are a certain number of attributes, so he imagined in this case five attributes, and each attribute would have different levels, in this case three levels. A pattern is a choice of level for each attribute. So I have the cyan pattern. Then he made a network out of this. So each of the nodes, he assumed he had those differential equations that I was writing down at the beginning uh, for the, uh, these rate models. And uh, the coupling between the nodes in a column is inhibitory. The idea is that uh, and this is, this is true in the visual system, so this, this is, uh, there are analogs where this is actually known anatomically, uh, that you have inhibitory coupling. That means that if this node, the middle node, is bigger than the other two nodes, it will tend to suppress the other two nodes even more so that you get a strong signal. So that's the inhibitory couplings there. But then there's also a notion that's called Hebbian learning. Uh, that in neuroscience, uh, the popular way of saying it is that neurons that fire together wire together. And uh, the idea is that all of these neurons uh, for this cyan pattern would uh, burst together, and therefore the, sy the synapses would uh, uh, form between these uh, uh, five cells, and uh, they would be... Uh, uh, activation, they would be uh, excitatory uh, connections. So you have a network of differential equations. Now, something that uh, we, well, let me point out that th what's nice about these networks is that they can store more than one pattern. So in this case, I have the cyan pattern and the magenta pattern. And I'm getting a different network because there are different sets of couplings than when I only had one pattern present. Uh, so there are learned, he imagined that there are learned patterns when, for example, in binocular rivalry, the two images, the way the experiments are performed, the subject is shown each of the two in, images separately. They learn those images, and then they start the experiment with left eye, right eye. So there are learned patterns but you could imagine in this dynamics that there would be a pattern, let's say, all, all along the middle. Every middle one is the highest. That pattern is not learned, but it could be in the dynamics, and we call those derived patterns. So uh, the nice thing about this idea that you, Wilson, had is that it can predict patterns that you did not learn. And this is, uh, th this is definitely a, a big plus for such a thing. So uh, we, being uh, several of the postdocs at MBI, and I, uh, uh, Casey uh, McMillan, Yun Jiao Wang, and uh, Tyler McMillan, said, hey, this is really neat. Uh, let's see if we can understand, let's see if we can use this idea for generalized rivalry to tell us something about binocular rivalry. So let's go back to the scrambled images of the monkey text. How do you model? Well, there are two regions in this rectangle. I'll call them the blue region and the white re uh, region. In this picture, text is in blue, monkey is in white. Over here, monkey is in blue, text is in white. So we would like to say that uh, the Wilson network has two attributes, the kind of picture in the white area, the kind of picture in the blue area, and each one has two levels, monkey or text. We have the inhibitory couplings in the column and excitatory couplings that monkey in white co correlates with text in blue. Text in white corresponds to monkey in blue. Now this network has a couple of symmetries. You can swap one, two, three, four, that's swap the rows, you can swap the columns, or you can take the composition. Suppose that the swap the rows acts trivially at a Hopf bifurcation. Well, I'm back to this again. A Hopf bifurcation, get a periodic solution. Then x1 and x2 will be the same. That's a fusion state. So 
Rho, in order to get anything that you're going to interpret from this experiment, Rho has to act non-trivially. That is, x2 of t must be a half period out of phase with x1, x4 a half a period out of phase with x3. Swapping the columns can either be in phase or out of phase. If it's in phase, you get the full uh, monkey and text pictures. If they're out of phase, you get the scrambled pictures alternating. In short, this Wilson, uh, using uh, Wilson's idea, I'll call this a Wilson model, you get a prediction for the percepts, the four percepts, coming in a very natural way. If you, th there is something I wanted to mention that in the visual system, the vertical line is distinguished. Uh, that is, uh, people do different things with the vertical line than they do with skew lines. And uh, in uh, Suzuki and Grabowiecki uh, utilize this uh, to do another rivalry experiment where they had uh, geometric images like the ones that are pictured here. And imagine cutting this in the vertical and then swapping. So in the, from the, this picture, take the left part, and from this picture, take the right part. That's this composite picture. It's like, this is like the scrambled image. Take the right uh, part here and the left part there. You get these. And what did people see when they were given, shown these pictures? Left eye, right eye. Half the time they saw the alternation between these two images and they saw these two images appear for much of the rest of the time. This is exactly like the monkey text uh, thing. It's the same network that would be coming up. Now, those 24 dot experiments are really complicated to understand mathematically. It's a very large dimensional system to start thinking about. But uh, Tong, Meng, and Blake, who are uh, uh, vision scientists, uh, suggested in a review paper that just look at the four middle dots. So let me go back to the four middle dots. You have red and green on the diagonals across. And, um, Let's see what you would, might expect from this experiment. Well, you, you might expect to see, uh, when the pure dots, to come out with these kind of uh, pictures as well. So our question was, well, what's a Wilson network for, the, uh, for this uh, experiment? And the idea is that there are four dots, and those are four attributes of the picture, and there are two there's a choice of two colors for each dot. So I have four columns, and red and green are the two levels for each column. The all red picture gives you excitatory couplings, that's the heavy in learning, between all the dots on the top. Uh, similarly, for all the dots or discs on the bottom. Now, here is where I'd like to use some extra neuroscience information. Vertical, I said, is special. So it is reasonable to assume that the strength of the couplings between 1 and 3 will be different than between 1 and two, 7, because this is crossing the vertical, this is parallel to the vertical. It's also reasonable to assume that uh, dots that are further apart, geometrically, will couple with a strength that is less than uh, uh, the ones that are nearer. If you make that assumption, the symmetry group of this network is, uh, I can swap um, the uh, top and bottom, I can swap left and right, and I can also swap the two squares, the red square and the green square. If you go through and do the bifurcation analysis with this symmetry group, what you find is you do get these derived patterns that are sitting there. So that's kind of neat, uh, that you start with the pure, and in this context, you would get decouple. But let's look at the other experiment. Uh, that is, to look at the experiment where you had uh, the scrambled images, scrambled colored images. Now, uh, I'm going to write the network slightly differently. I'll have red on top, green, 
below in upper left, but in lower left, red on the bottom, green on top. Makes no difference. It's just a question of uh, relabeling uh, th what, they ref what things refer to. And it did that because now this image has exactly the same uh, network as the uh, one uh, with, the, uh, the, with the pure images. So uh, the mathematics says prediction, the per percepts in these two experiments will be the same. And that's quite different from the percepts in the monkey text, and scrambled monkey text. So without worrying about what the percepts are, they should be the same. And, and that's kind of neat. OK. So when you, um, when you have an experiment like, or a theory like this, everybody would say, well, OK, can you predict something? Everything that we've done so far is post-diction. And uh, we came up with this idea, and there's an experimentalist at um, uh, Ohio State, uh, Zhang Lin Lu, who uh, uh, works on these kinds of things and can do the experiments. So he suggested, take two pictures that are rectangular, but a composite of three rectangles. There's an A picture, a B picture, a C picture. Show this one to the left eye, and show B, C, A to the right eye. If you assume that the strength of connections from AB is greater than the strength, uh, the strength of connections to AC, then this network has a Z2 plus Z2 symmetry, and you predict eight percepts. Uh, notice a, uh, over here I have ACA, ABA. The reason is A on the left is on the left. Uh, a on the right is on the right, and that's where these two things, and you could have either B or C in between. If all of the uh, strengths were the same, you would also get A, A, B as a possibility. And that, uh, so there's two different experiments that can be performed. They did the experiments, uh, at least uh, they've done the experiments in, um, uh, with a few of the people in the lab. Of the four people who took the experiments, three saw these eight percepts and nothing else, and one person saw only seven of these. Uh, so uh, there's something going on here, and uh, really we're just at the beginning of trying to explore what, it's going, uh, what is going on. I want to just end with saying there are lots of people who were involved in the uh, in what I've talked about today, uh, Luciana Buono, Jim Collins, and Ian Stewart on the gates, uh, the rivalry I mentioned before, these are the people involved. And thank you very much. Are there any patterns of the way of birds walk? Of birds, how the bir birds walk? Oh, birds walking. Um, so two-legged animals. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, wrote a paper uh, trying to predict what the various gates were uh, for two-legged animals. And there are a lot of them that you may not think of. Uh, uh, first of all, there's uh, walking, and then there's running. And both walk and run are, ha are half period out of phase gates when you swap. Uh, but when you, um, if you talk to, uh, uh, now if you look at biomechanics, the uh, walk and run are completely different gates. Uh, in the walk, you're swinging your leg like a pendulum. In a run, you're using it as a pogo stick. And if you think about what's going on in your ankle, uh, first of all, in a, um, it, you don't actually control legs. You control joints. And every joint is, uh, has, an, uh, has two muscle groups, uh, flexors and extensors, push and pull, if you like. And in the case of a walk, you rotate your ankle, the two muscle groups have to be out of phase. If you use a pogo stick, you're keeping the ankle rigid. The uh, uh, two 
muscles must be uh, in phase. And this gives a symmetry difference between uh, walk and run, which is kind of amusing. Uh, and it also explains why you need twice the number of nodes uh, as legs. So in order to do this uh, analysis, you would need a four-node network for a two-legged animal. And then you can go and start classifying gates, like the gallop, uh, the secondary gates as well. And there are gallops uh, that people do, you know, well, that's a skip, and then a gallop is something like this. And if you look at all the gates, there are about eight or ten of them that you get by symmetry. And uh, birds do some of them. Different kinds of birds do different ones. But, but it's a, there are two kinds of birds outside. Yeah. You have uh, Jean de Barro and Sabia. Uh -huh. Jean de Barro walks like this. Uh -huh. And Sabia jumps. Uh -huh. so, yeah. Like, do non-abelian uh, groups come into this? And Great question. Uh, no, I mean, really, uh, they, uh, the problem with non-abelian is that uh, the irreducible representations get to be more than one-dimensional. With abelian, uh, they're one-dimensional, and that really helps things a lot. Uh, in the uh, experiment here, if you assume that AC has the same strength as AB, you will get S3, you will get a non-abelian group appearing. Uh, uh, but that doesn't seem to be the case uh, from the experiments. So I don't know of any example where a non-abelian group appears. The other problem is that in rivalry, uh, the subject has to be able to describe quickly what he or she is seeing. And if it's too complicated, they're not going to be able to do it. And the non-abelian groups tend to have more complicated structures associated with them. So I, I would love to find an example with a non-abelian group, but I don't know of one at the moment. To just take the opportunity. No. No, just to mention that when you, you, you said about Gallup being a secondary bifurcation, yeah. maybe that you, you may know where what kind of symmetry this is uh, bifurcating from. Yes. I mean, if you have a gate, mm -hmm. and when this secondary right. bifurcation and, helps. And that, that was the, yeah, so the reason uh, the, that uh, long-legged animals tend to do a rotary gallop uh, is because the bifurcation comes from a pace, and, that's, and the bifurcation from a um, trot goes to a transverse gallop. So it's exactly that reason. Uh, <laughs> That's okay. Well, uh, the, question of uh, the question was, uh, have I ever looked at dances? Uh, well, there are several levels on which you could ask that question. Uh, but the, um, the try I, we've tried without success uh, to come up with something that would, uh, you know, which, which somehow uh, take various dance steps or con configurations and relate them to symmetries uh, in some sort of model. Uh, it's, it's a natural question, and it, it has come up, uh, but I don't have a satisfactory answer. In the case of uh, split-brain patients, what happened with the uh, binocular rivalry? Ah, Split brain patients? Yeah. Um, so I, I guess the simple answer is I don't know exactly. Uh, but what uh, Zhang Lin Lu has told me is that they want to use rivalry and illusions, uh, both of them, to try to diagnose certain kinds of Ill, uh, visual in, uh, illnesses. Uh, and uh, that's, that's one of the, so besides it's just fun to work on, uh, this, this is their ultimate goal, is to be able to get a diagnostic tool. Uh, so that's sort of the inverse uh, of the question that you're asking, but I, I don't, there's nothing uh, that I can say, uh, here, here's, here's something going on. 
Yeah, that makes it much more likely for NIH to fund this. Yeah. So just before to, uh, we thank the speaker, I'd like just to invite everyone to uh, coffee outside where we will have the opportunity to talk to Marty a little bit more. So thank you very much, Marty.